It was a phone call I will never forget. Happened about five or six days before Christmas. Oh, back in the last century, I think it was 1993. And it was my cousin, uh, Andrea, on the phone. And uh, she was told me, shockingly, that she would not be at Christmas Eve dinner at her mother's house. It was something to me that was inconceivable. How could you not be at the nine of, what is it, the seven fishes, not nine. It turns out to be nine at my aunt's house. The seven fishes dinner. This is the whole year of gatherings of family all culminate on Christmas Eve. And Andrea, my cousin, one of my oldest first cousins, was the ringleader. She would be buying the gifts. She would be decorating. She would be doing everything. But she wasn't coming this year, and it was unfathomable until she told me why. She had invited the love of her life, her friend and uh, partner, Donna, to come to Christmas Eve dinner at her mother's. And she asked my Aunt Anna Mae, can I bring Donna? And thinking, my God, let's think of all the other members of the family who've been divorced so many times, who's a drug addict, who's just got a jail sentence uh, behind. I mean, Donna, this should be a wonderful woman. Why would this be the problem? But my aunt, in her old school way, said I would be uncomfortable for her to be in my house. And my Aunt Anna Mae generally got her way and still does around most things. And so Andrea chose to go another path. It was a radical departure uh, to go against family tradition of such a magnitude. But Andrea had chosen. She had chosen the love that she had experienced and she was going to go another path on Christmas Eve. It wasn't as if she was thrown out of the family. It wasn't as grave as some other stories that we all know and cringe about and are still recovering from. But still, this was big. And everybody around tried to make it not so bad. We would all say, well, Anna Mae didn't like her other daughter-in-law either. And it took a couple of years for that ice to melt. Don't worry, it will take time. It took about 25 years, and I'll get to that in a bit. But so it was in my household. And uh, I think this came to mind, especially this week, after hearing what the Pope said on Wednesday about civil unions and same-sex couples. And it brought up that conversation about that Christmas, which we were missing a key member of the family. And the Pope, somehow, as a pastor, knows these situations. He must know uh, in his life and care for other uh, couples who are same sex, whether they're in civil unions or married. He must know and care for them. He must also have a sense of, his, of God's great depth of love, which is a mystery to all of us, and somehow is trusting, as he made those statements on Wednesday, that God somehow is big enough in a family to embrace people no matter where they are in life and bring them all together. And he's somehow comfortable uh, that God loves us enough to be able to stretch and love those people in our lives who are going a path that we might not agree with. And so he said what he said. And notice, while everybody else is falling over themselves trying to put words into the Pope's mouth about what he meant or what he didn't mean, the Pope remains like the Sphinx, quiet. And I think he's doing this because, as a good Jesuit is, or would do, he is trying to get the Christian people to think about this, to dialogue about this, to hear the experience of one another, why this is upsetting, why, for any number of reasons. And we know there's a diverse set of opinions on this, probably in this very room. Some who say, well, that's not, he hasn't gone far enough because there should be gay marriage in the church. To the others who write incendiary letters, there's no other issue in the church right now that you get more incendiary letters about when you say something nice about gay or lesbian people. Let's face it, we, Father Gill used to have a draws of them in his office. The Pope knows this too. And he knows somehow, as a Christian people, we can do better. And that things are changing. And how families 
and parents are embracing their gay and lesbian and transgendered brothers, as, uh, sons and daughters, and bringing them into the fold, loving them in a way that may not have been possible a generation before, and we all realize that. But conversations have to happen if we are to understand and implement what we heard this afternoon in this gospel. That command to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself as yourself. God is mysterious, and he doesn't, and Jesus doesn't go on more about that except by example, and telling us the story of the Good Samaritan who goes after the one who is on the side of the road, who no one else would help, and it would be the outcast who was the one who would provide charity. Because neighbor, in the Jewish context, when Jesus said this, said, oh, I just need to love and care for my other Jewish brothers and sisters, and I'm okay. Not those other unsaved, unclean people. Jesus says, no. No, it's radical. Love is radical. Jesus says that God loves us beyond all measure, beyond all human understanding. It's so mysterious beyond which we can't fathom. And I think the Pope knows that and understands that and as a pastor has a heart for everybody and wants a home for everybody. Let us walk together and figure it out. This Pope's not like his predecessor who would start from theological dogma and work his way down to practical and pastoral applications. Pope Francis works the other way. He starts with the pastoral issue and problem and thinks about it and then seeks to go up from there. He's not changing the theology of marriage. That would do thousands of years of Christian theology. It would blow everyone's mind because we are not on one page on this subject. It is something that we must continue to think about, must continue to dialogue with. It's something that causes us to want to reach out to someone who we don't agree with and try to understand, walk in their shoes. That might be the most loving thing that one can do, to walk in someone's shoes that we don't agree with or we don't understand, or someone who threatens us in some ways by their words or their actions. What is underneath it all? That's what radical love seeks to do, to understand first and to judge later, if not give it to God entirely. It's part, all of this is part of a much bigger picture. And while we are all watching the helicopter come and go from the grounds of the White House two weekends ago when the president got the coronavirus because he didn't wear a mask or whatever it was, the Pope quietly released an encyclical letter called Fratelli Tutti, All Brothers and Sisters, in which he lays out in this kind of long document what it means to be a part of the Christian family, and that the family is radically bigger than we can imagine it. That matter of fact, all of the human population, all the human race is one family, living in one home, the earth. And we are called to care for one another radically and care for our home as well, the earth, lest there be no place to live and no place to enjoy love with one another. I commend it to you because it, he, he points out in a number of places how we must dialogue, how there must be kindness, how we must be like that good Samaritan, loving those who seem to fall on the margins or maybe beyond the reach or beyond farther than we would like to reach to them. The Pope has said in, in many ways that we are called to love radically and not just uh, in areas in which we want to stay in our lane that kind of give us permission not to do other loving acts. We are to love the child in the womb as much as we are to love the immigrant on the border, to love the poor, to help all those in need. They all go together in this radical gift of love. You can't have one without the other. And we're reminded in this first reading quite clearly Part of our loving is remembering. The Jews always remembered their past as slaves 
in exile in Egypt. They remembered how they were treated. And how did they remember that? By making sure that their laws told them they always had to look after the widow, the orphan, the enslaved, the migrant, because we were once there ourselves. Let us pass laws that help us remember that truth so that we might always be loving and not fall back to be like the oppressors who held us in bondage all those years before. It's radical. And perhaps this message of love is difficult. And God is sometimes elusive in letting it be a part of our lives. Because it's the human person, we are all mysteries to one another and to ourselves sometimes. And the challenge is, is to see in our world and in ourselves, even in our incompleteness, even in our brokenness and in our sinfulness, that God is seeking to love us beyond all measure, whoever we are, however we love, wherever we may be. But he wants to walk with us. He wants to accompany us on that journey. And he asks us to let him walk with us as well. Because one of the things we as human people have in us so strongly is the desire to know everything and not listen to anyone. To be confident of our own opinions to such an extent that not even God, not even these scriptures, have a chance of making a dent in what we believe. He gives us the Eucharist, not because we're perfect, but because we are all in our own way growing to love and be loved by God so we can love and be loved by one another. Now, how did this all resolve itself 25 years later? It was all about charity. It was all about loving neighbor. And sadly, uh, my, the other sister-in-law, the other daughter-in-law in the picture, my cousin-in-law, Margie, was dying of pancreatic cancer about three Christmases ago. No, five Christmases ago. And everybody in the fall had gathered around to provide hospice. My mother, my anime, Andrea, Donna, they were all together for about a month <laughs> with each other at Margie's and Frankie's house next door to anime's, caring for this woman, this kindest, most beautiful cousin-in-law I could ask for as she died of cancer. And I think the exchange of love of Margie for both Donna and Andrea in my anime, and the love that was given back to her in care, finally broke the ice. Finally, there was a way. And in only an Italian way could this happen. But it was at the funeral, or thereafter, that my anime started to talk to Donna like she had been talking to her for the last 25 years, like nothing had happened. But finally, there was love. There was acceptance because so much love had been shared in that moment around death. And that death, when infused with Christ's love, brings new life and new hope and resurrection. That we all trust so dearly in a God who loves us to the core. How precious we are to him. And how precious all of us are to one another. Whatever walk we find ourselves on, God cherishes us and wishes all of us, every day of our lives, a very Merry Christmas.